Hello, and welcome to my presentation on the Scottish witch hunts past and present. My name is Steffi Von Scott, and I am the presiding officer of the Scottish Pagan Federation. I am also the co-founder of the Scotta Goddess Temple. I speak at pagan events across Scotland, as well as to colleges, universities, and city and community councils, and to museums representing Scottish paganism in general. I also taught a class on contemporary paganism in modern Scotland at the Glasgow University's course on religion and spirituality in Scotland, and I am the creator of the Pagan Discrimination Survey. Now, I was born in the Scottish town of Paisley, a place remembered for two things. Firstly, its historic weaving industry, with its world-famous Paisley pattern, which is named after the town itself. The Paisley pattern put the town on the map, and during the mid-19th century it saw Paisley weavers travelling all across the world, establishing mills and textile weaving factories from my hometown in Scotland, across to Europe and out to the Americas. Even today, fashion icons, movie legends and famous pop stars wear the Paisley pattern with pride, and a prince even named his record label after it. Though the Paisley pattern itself has an even more ancient and mysterious origin, which becomes rather evident when you visit Paisley Museum today, and you are met with a large plaque of a Mesopotamian protective deity, the eagle-headed Apkula. The Apkula were angelic beings sent from the Sumerian god Enki to bestow wisdom and knowledge upon mankind. They are seen depicted in the ancient stone reliefs in Ashurbanipal's palace, flanking the Syrian Tree of Life, which is where the pattern originated, and these murals date back over 3,000 years. Secondly, Paisley is famous for its historic witch trials, also known as the Bagaran Witch Trials. These trials saw Paisley play host to the last mass execution for witchcraft in Western Europe. In 1696, Christian Shaw, the 11-year-old daughter of John Shaw, the Laird of Bagan, had become increasingly unwell with a mysterious illness. It was said she would throw herself down on the floor in contortions, acting as if she had completely taken leave of her senses. So doctors were brought in, but no cure was found, and her symptoms, uh, her symptoms began to get stranger and more elaborate as the days went by. And as months went on, she is said to have coughed up a great many items such as human hair, pieces of coal, hay, small animal bones, candles and pins, though I would add that none of these items were said to be um, covered in phlegm as if they had actually been in her stomach. They were all quite dry. And on one occasion, she was actually said to have thrown, flown through the air. At the height of this hysteria, Christian Shaw concluded that she was bewitched and accused a young maid named Catherine Campbell of cursing her. The church were called in to help, and the result was a far-reaching witch hunt. Christian went on to name several people, all employed by her father, and many of those had scolded or complained about her in the past. In the end, 21 people were brought to trial in Paisley, before a special commission of 17 judges. Of those accused, 17 were declared not guilty and released, but seven, including Catherine Campbell, were condemned to be burned at the stake at Paisley's Gallows Green on the 10th of June, 1697. Six of these were killed, but one committed suicide in his cell before the actual burning took place. These trials and the subsequent executions all saw a dying witch's curse placed upon my hometown and its descendants. It was one of the accused so-called witches, Agnes Naismith, who uttered this curse that has been blamed for Paisley's ills ever since, cursing all of those in attendance at her execution and their descendants. This curse would be blamed for every major tragedy that has faced the town from that point on. And to avert this curse, the ashes of those accused were buried under a horseshoe in the 17th century to award off this curse. And it is said that every time this horseshoe has been dislodged, there has been a major disaster in the town. The last time the horseshoe was dislodged, apparently a teenage girl was found lying in the street, and the town's Paisley Development Trust took it upon themselves to design a permanent bronze tondo as part of the memorial 
to the victims of the Peasley Witch Trials, with the horseshoe permanently fixed to this in its rightful place to avert any future calamities. Now, with regards to Christian Shaw, the young girl who caused all this madness, she went on to found the Renfrewshire thread industry, introducing the spinning of fine linen thread to Scotland. In 1721, it is said she travelled to Holland with her mother to learn Dutch spinning techniques under the guise of a woman searching for a new husband. And it is said she smuggled associated machinery back to Scotland in her luggage. Shaw established a small thread manufacturing company in Johnston on her return, and her early work no doubt played an instrumental part in why my town of Paisley played centre stage to the rise of the Paisley weaving industry, and to the birth of the Paisley pattern that followed. We learn about both of these things from a very early age in school, and perhaps the latter and parts of the former are why my town has such a mysterious undercurrent that is still felt today. Growing up in Paisley, these things were just part of everyday life. However, these events have certainly shaped its contemporary history. To date, Paisley has produced more witchcraft shops, more witchcraft theatrical productions, more witchcraft hist um, historic witchcraft reenactments, and more witchcraft related events than any other Scottish town that I know of. They even have a four day Halloween festival full of all things witchy. The town itself is home to the registered charity, the Renfrewshire Witch Hunt 1611, and this charity puts on many historical reenactments of the Bagaran witch hunts and witch trials, as well as witchcraft tours of the town. Paisley also hosted the Opera of the Paisley Witches and the award-winning play Serafina, based on the Paisley Witch Trials here. Paisley has also had more witchcraft shops than any other Scottish town that I know of, from Mirren's Cauldron to Aquarius to Callanish Stones to the Witchcraft Emporium, and it even plays host to a large pagan uh, and witchcraft book publisher. Perhaps because of its history of all things witchy, Paisley is also home to many of Scotland's most prominent witches and pagans today. It is perhaps no coincidence that the presiding officer of the Scottish Pagan Federation lives here. The, organization, or the organisers of some of Scotland's most popular pagan moots also live or grew up here. And again, this includes the, or the organiser of Glasgow's longest running pagan moot, the organiser of uh, the South Lanarkshire pagan moot, the organiser of the Aberdeen pagan summer camp, and the creator of Scotland's most popular uh, witch markets. Now today, I am here to talk about the witch hunts in Scotland. However, unlike other talks that focus on the past, I am also going to be talking about some of the modern witch hunts going on today, both in Scotland and touching on the wider UK. Now, most of you know that the witch hunts really took off here in Scotland under King James VI, who later became King James I of England. Now, King James visited Denmark in 1590 to pick up his new Danish bride, and on the voyage back to Scotland, they both was caught in a storm, and uh, King James attributed the storm, as you would, um, to witchcraft, um, and this sparked a national panic, with several people accused over the following months. In 1591, one of the accused witches, Agnes Sampson, revealed that there were 200 witches, some from Denmark, who had sailed to the coastal town of North Berwick on Halloween night of 1590. And there the devil had preached to them and encouraged them to plot the king's destruction. Obviously, uh, this confession was, was taken under much duress and, and much uh, torture. Now, after hearing these confessions, even though they had been extorted by torture, King James and his advisors had came to believe that witchcraft conspiracy had threatened his reign. Thus began the North Berwick Witch Trials. Now, six years later, King James published his treatise, Demonology, a book which details the way the devil operates in the world, and it explained how the devil was the leader of the fallen angels who had become demons, and these demons made pacts with people and granted them special powers to work harmful magic. And according to James's book, there, therefore, witchcraft was a secret conspiracy between humans and demons, who were out to do all the harm they could. And this book would be used as a catalyst for the witch hunts that followed. 
It is estimated that there have been between four and 6,000 witch trials in Scotland as a result of these events. Now, most people attribute the origins of the witch hunts to Christianity. However, they predate this by millennia. And they began in a place we were, where we began our talk, the home of the Paisley pattern. Now, prejudice against witchcraft began in ancient Mesopotamia around 2000 BCE, when local wise women came under attack from the state religion of the time. Prior to this, folk healers could practice their craft to help heal and cure patients, and were even called upon to help by the temple. In the time period leading to this, civilization was made up of a series of interconnected city-states, all competing for supremacy. And at around 2300 BCE, this all changed. And this changed because Sargon of Akkad, who is widely thought to be the world's first emperor, unified uh, Sumer to the south with the Akkad to the north, creating the world's first empire. Now, following this move, and with the centralisation of palace-endorsed religion, we see a shift taking place between what was considered state control legitimate religions and those who practiced the craft out with the control of the state. In literature from this time period, we can see the image of the wise woman, folk healer or witch, take on board a more sinister form as she was demonized by the state religion so the priests and, exor and exorcists could hold monopoly over faith practice. Please bear in mind that this is long before Christianity took shape and during pagan times and the time when many different gods were venerated. And we can see many of the earliest concepts and beliefs of witchcraft uh, that still hold today take shape around this time period. Now many of these practices and beliefs would be adopted by the Jewish people during the Babylonian captivity at this point. Uh, and from there they would remain in place before being taken on board by Christianity, which would, done, which would one day become the next major state religion under the Roman Empire, which we know. It is in Mesopotamia we find the idea of ducking the witch originate, and we can read it taking shape in the place of the what is called the river ordeal, where the witch would be thrown in the river to ascertain her guilt or innocence. And again, this practice dates back over 4,000 years. So around the 1960s, uh, witchcraft and the word witch was reclaimed, and it's worth uh, covering why this happened. Now, the two previous decades before this uh, created the right environment for massive social shifts and social consciousness to take shape. And this started because of the devastation of World War I in the first half of the 1940s and the ca catastrophic loss of human life that it created. Up until that point, society still had a hangover from the old feudal gentry system and the class system in place. However, after the war ended, many soldiers did not return from the fight, most of them fathers and brothers, husbands, from all walks of life. What the war done was effectively it levelled the playing field of all social classes and social constraints from the previous few years, and it also changed the gender balance of society forever. As an example of this, in Canada, at the beginning of the war, only 600,000 women held jobs in the private sector. But by its peak in 1943, over 1 1.2 million women had jobs in this sector, and this created a massive shift in gender dynamics of society. The aftermath of the war was still felt in the second half of the 1940s, and this led to the Great Depression of the 1950s. However, in 1951, something else happened. And that was the Witchcraft Act of 1735 was repealed. And this wasn't really considered as a contention spoof at the time, but this paved the way for the reclamation of the word witch, which many viewed as a demonised term for wise women in relationship to many of the folk healers who were accused and executed during the witch trials. In 1954, just three years later, Gerald Gardner, who is widely rec regarded as the father of modern witchcraft, began publishing his work with the now famous Witchcraft Today, which was released to great controversy. His Meaning of Witchcraft was released uh, in 1959, and the next year saw the dawn of the 1960s, with the, re with the release of the very first female contraceptive pill, 
which set the stage for what came after. The 60s arrived on the back of all this, uh, with the, the rigid culture that existed before, unable to constrain the demands for great, greater individual freedoms and the changing dynamics of society, which now demanded more of that. Uh, and this was a period of counterculture and revolution. In America, it was a year that saw massive transformations in areas of race, religion, women's roles in society, and the rise of the civil rights movement, um, second wave feminism, and the growing push for equality, women's liberation, gay and civil rights movements, and the rise of equal rights amendment. Uh, and the reper re repercussions to this was that there was a rise in evangelism and the new American right, which pushed the, pushed the rhetoric that women should accept their traditional roles in society. Now, the backlash of evangelism and the new American right was severe, with the complete rejection of religions that had came before, and an embrace of more progressive religions, New Age movements, and renewed interest in Eastern religions and philosophies across society. And this was fertile ground for the witchcraft cults that followed. It was during this decade that also first saw the rise of goddess spirituality, the cult of modern witchcraft, and new pagan religions blossoming across the Western world. Being openly pagan had been illegal in the United Kingdom until 1951, and with the repeal of the Witchcraft Act, this all changed. Uh, prior to that time, modern witches and pagans could face imprisonment or even death, and while this made uh, finally legal to practice paganism once again, it was not without consequences, as this led to a series of modern witch hunts as a backlash to that. Throughout the 80s and early 90s, an individual could lose their job or livelihood, uh, could be investigated by social service and lose custody of their children if they had come out as a pagan. And because of this, of these incidents, um, the pagan community have tended to keep themselves and their faiths hidden from the wider world for fear of discrimination. And while attitudes have changed in modern society, we still have a long way to go. In 1999, Dr. Ralph Morse, the first National Youth Officer for the Pagan Federation, was suspended from his post of Head of Drama at Shenfield High School in Essex. In 2007, a Neil Druid group from Dorset was subject to threats and abuse, while pagans in Glastonbury were physically attacked by a Christian youth group the very same year and several address, arrests were made. And these are just a few examples at the turn of the century. Now, a decade on for this, we find while attitudes continue to soften to pagans in mainstream society, discrimination still exists where pagans reveal themselves and their faiths openly. Since 2017, the pagan shop Spellbound in Gloucester has been a target of a hate crime and hate campaign where staff have received death threats and arson threats. The shop owner has been subject to verbal abuse. She has her car damaged. She's had glue put through the front of her shop, eggs pelted in her shop window. She's even had exorcists performed outside her shop. And recently in March 2019, the shop was attacked when an explosive was thrown into the shop while it was open. Now the Pagan Federation itself was founded in 1971 as a way to combat these discriminations that we have just discussed. And this year marks our 50th anniversary and much has changed in that time. Now, paganism as a faith community has been growing in stature and acceptance for some time now, thanks to the dedication and hard work of the Scottish Pagan Federation. The Scottish PF is one of the most active and effective pagan representative bodies in Europe. In 2001, the Scottish census clearly established that paganism was the sixth largest non-Christian religion here in Scotland, with our census figures coming in only a few hundred people below the Jewish community. Our figures polled at 5,194 pagans here in Scotland in 2011, though experts believe the true figure is closer to 30,000 here and growing. Like most major religious bodies, we are involved in a great many areas of community work, from education to interfaith, to youth outreach, to university chaplaincy, disability and inclusion, and to hospital and prison chaplaincy. As an organisation, we also defend pagans against attack from sections of the media, and we work to improve the balance and accuracy of their coverage of the pagan communities here in Scotland. 
As of 2004, we became a reg recognised religious body with the authority to conduct full legal pagan weddings here in Scotland, and we maintain a team of dedicated celebrants for that very purpose. And today our celebrants are so successful that there are now more pagan weddings here than weddings by the Mormon and Jewish communities. At the same time, we are also witnessing an increase in numbers celebrating ancient pagan traditions in modern Scotland. This phenomenon has grown in popularity in today's modern secular society, certainly more so than over the past few decades. As an example, the annual Beltane Fire Society is festival draws over 12,000 uh, visitors to Edinburgh. Meanwhile, over in the west of Scotland, Largs Viking Festival is now in its 42nd year, and it's an event that many of our heathen and Norse pagan community have attended since its inception. Yet, all of these changes to public perception of paganism seems at odds with the discrimination that still exists today in society against the pagan community. And to ascertain the true extents of this discrimination and prejudice against paganism in Scottish society, the Scottish Pagan Federation launched a series of pagan discrimination surveys to gather information from our communities both north and south of the border and also across Europe of what discrimination was taking place so to better tackle it and identify the problem areas. So what did the results of this discrimination survey tell us? Well, it told us that 40% of pagans in Scotland eh, have suffered direct discrimination because they are pagans, while over 60% of pagans knew someone else in the pagan community who has suffered direct discrimination. Over 40% felt anxious or depressed because of other people's attitudes to, to their faith, and over 50% uh, of pagans said they have been made to feel ashamed of their own faith through people's comments. And also 40% um, fear that their children would be bullied or harassed in schools if the families uh, of people in the school knew they were pagans. Uh, it also told us that 40% um, would be less likely to report uh, incidents of discrimination at the workplace because they are pagan, because they feel they just wouldn't be taken seriously. And um, over 60% have had people of other faiths try to convert them. Uh, also, 70% have said the, the people have told them they worship the devil, and 60% have been told that they will go to hell because of their faith. And over 90% of respondents feel that paganism is treated less seriously than other faith traditions, with many people commenting that paganism should really be taught in non-denominational schools to help reduce this discrimination. And here are the comments captured in the survey. I'm not going to read all of them, but you can see some of them yourself and you can read them later. My religious studies teacher told me paganism is not a real or recognised religion. I have been verbally abused because of my faith and it seems worse now than it, is, it was 60 years ago. I work for the police and if I revealed my faith, it would make my position untenable. I am grateful for not being hurt because of my belief, but I know others that have and we should not have to live in fear. In high school, pupils and students would tease me and mock me because of my faith and teachers would actually allow this to happen. I am a teacher in a faith school, and if I revealed my faith, it would make it would affect my position. I received hate mail for being a pagan, and I had to have the police intervene to stop it. My son's RE teacher told my boys that I would go to hell when I died, and she would not acknowledge me if she spoke to me at periods evenings, and she acted as if I didn't exist. And I had to explain to two very traumatised little boys that I wouldn't go to hell and I would be okay. During university, I was chased by a group of men, and I was never physically uh, touched, however, things were thrown at me such as garbage from the street. I had to leave a job because of accusations of witchcraft. I was purposely excluded from conferences for being a pagan. My daughter was verbally abused over a period of time by her RE teacher at school. Last summer, I was attacked verbally for being a pagan, and I was so shaken, I had a panic attack because of it. This needs to stop, as no one in modern 21st century Scotland should experience this. So what's been done off the back of these surveys? Well, we have formally written to the Scottish 
uh, government, including a direct appeal to Scotland's First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, as well as to several prominent MSPs, urging action and support in tackling mass discrimination against both modern witches and pagans in Scotland. In April this year, Interfaith Glasgow took up the call and they hosted an anti-pagan discrimination event off the back of these survey results to show their support and solidarity to the pagan community here. We also took uh, these surveys to the world stage where we presented a discussion panel at the Parliament of the World Religions earlier this month. And this was called Anti-Pagan Discrimination, the Untold Story. And there we were joined by the coordinator of the Pagan Federation International and the Pagan Federation president uh, from England and Wales. And off the back of this event, uh, Pagan Pride Italy are planning to translate our survey into Italian and running uh, these surveys to assess discrimination against pagans in Italy. Uh, and this is the second country to do so after Germany uh, asked us for the survey too. And not only that, but we have been approached by several other countries uh, for our survey questions to, to reword them into their own languages, which includes Venezuela and even Mexico. And we expect many other countries to follow. And, and this is just really wonderful to be able to lead by example, with many countries looking to Scottish pagans as leaders and pioneers. And at the same time as this, there are also those accused of witchcraft in our society who have no links to either contemporary witchcraft or paganism. And there have been over 20,000 victims of accusations of witchcraft and ritual attacks reported in the last decade alone across 60 countries. This includes over 5,250 unlawful and wrongful killings, 60 disappearances in su suspicious circumstances, and 14,700 attempted killings and physical attacks, and also 420 incidents of, of trafficking. And in many cases, these are older women and children with disabilities who are the most affected. It was reported that more than 2,586 older women were killed between 2004 and 2009 in, Taz in Tanzania uh, as a result of witchcraft accusations. And here in the United Kingdom, in a period of uh, 2017 and 2018, there were 1,630 reported cases of child survivors of abuse related to accusations of witchcraft. And again, this is a, an increase of 11% from the previous year. So these figures are pretty harrowing. Earlier this year, Professor Ronald Hutton, who sits on the Witchcraft and Human Rights Network, took up the case with the United Nations in support, of the, in support from the Pagan Federation, where a historic uh, resolution was signed outlawing, outlawing these harmful practices, accusations of witchcraft and ritual attacks, which is called uh, HPAWRA. To close off, I would like to weave all of these threads together, as there is much in common with the witch hunts that happened in Scotland during the 1700s and the witch hunts that still exist today. While witches today are not garroted or burnt alive at the stake, they still suffer some extreme prejudice. In the last year alone, the Pagan Federation has had reports of a great number of cases of discrimination taking place. Here in Scotland, the worst of these saw a family having to leave their home from a campaign of abuse by neighbours after one of the neighbours found out their neighbour was a witch. This led to shouts of witch whenever the mother left home, with neighbours banging on the back door to terrify the children there. They, smashed, uh, they threatened to smash the windows of the home in, and bottles were smashed on her back porch where her six-year-old daughter played. Her bins were emptied all over her garden, and there were threats of violence against her 15-year-old son, who was later assaulted on his way home from school. And in one extreme incident, while heavily pre pregnant, she went into labour early, after the neighbour's son started hurling abuse at her through her back door window at 2am when she got up to have a glass of water. In another extreme incident, they started wiping excrement on her front door. Meanwhile, in England, we saw a case where a mother had her children removed from her just for being pagan uh, and having witchcraft-related symbols in her home. This case we saw where social services got involved and her children were removed from her from January and have only been recently returned uh, after action by the Pagan Federation. That's like almost a year, 10 months of having your children removed just for being pagan. And again, due, due to discrimination against the mother, no one listened to her concerns about the father or his drug use around the children. 
And when social services finally tested him, they discovered the father had a very serious drug problem and he was the real risk to the children. For too long, pagans have been an invisible faith community here in Scotland. Many of us have no choice but simply to live with the prejudice we face on a regular basis, as if it's something we have to just keep silent about and tolerate as part of our everyday life, the cost of practising our faith. This position is not acceptable, nor should it be, and discrimination and prejudice should never be tolerated. The Pagan Federation exists to combat these issues and more, and we have so much work to do. Thank you for listening, and thank you to Remembering the Accused of the Witches of Scotland for inviting me to speak. Thank you. Thank you for listening, and thank you to the people behind Remembering the Accused Witches of Scotland for inviting me along to speak today. Thank you.